So I want to just um, talk about the last thing I'll do today before we get into our time of prayer and celebrating communion. Um, and I hope the person who has my communion, uh, what is it called, my communion glasses uh, is ready. Maybe Pastor Sheila, you can check that for me. I want to just uh, end, we've talked, and, 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 and I love what Val said about practicing. Here's the thing I want to tell you. Today, as you leave this place, you're going to leave a very different person. And I'm not even talking about anything spooky. I'm just saying, even just the decisions you've made today make you different. You're going to feel very different. I think it was, I don't know who it was who said they felt lighter. I think it was Val. You will feel lighter. There's nothing like giving up control. There's nothing like telling God you are in charge. You're in charge. Some of you have been going through some difficult situations that have been really puzzling you about God's love. And I suspect after today, you're going to leave this place like, God, here I am. You know what? Whether things work for me or they don't, I love you anyway. Yeah? And that you're going to find such peace in your heart, regardless of the situation. The peace will come before the situation changes. And so I really believe today you're going to see some differences uh, as you leave this place. Now, some of you are, you've not sat in church for a whole day before. I understand. And maybe, maybe this is hard. So I'm going to ask you, if you're feeling sleepy, just stand. You can go and stand at the back anytime when I'm talking or on the sides where the wind is flowing. If you start feeling like you're feeling really warm and cozy and you feel like you're sinking, it's not the Holy Spirit. It's not the everlasting arms that are enveloping you right now. Those are other arms. You say, get thee behind me, Satan. And you stand up and you go to another place so that you're able to make sure you stay in. Because God is not done with us. Tell your neighbor, God is not done with us yet. Luke chapter 15, verse 11 to 13. I want to talk a bit about um, the last thing that I, I, I just really sense strongly I should talk about. These are discipleship conversations, remember. And the thing that I really sensed today, apart from surrender and sacrifice, I felt like God would have me speak about the prodigal son. Uh, the prodigal son. Luke chapter 15. Verse 11 to 13, Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. How many sons? Two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of your estate now before you die. So the father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. Not long after that, the younger, a few days after this, the younger son packed all his belongings, moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. There's some things very interesting to me about this uh, story that I sense are very pertinent to us as we're going into this space that God is calling us to. There's something about the prodigal spirit that I want us to understand today that I think is something that will bring some freedom to different ones of us. A prodigal son is very different from a faithful son. And by the way, let me say this. I use son inclusively here. If you ever hear me say your sons, I'm not being gender insensitive. I'm using the word son in an inclusive way because you're a son of God. The Bible calls you a son. They shall be called sons of God. That's a gender inclusive word in the Bible. The Bible also uses female words to describe the church. Yeah, it says we're the bride. All the guys in the house, you're the bride. Come on, guys. Yeah. And you have to figure that one out. <laughs> And how to relate as a bride. Because God has called you his bride. You're part of his bride. It's just a reality. It's an inclusive word. And so when I say son here, I'm talking about both men and women. They are sons in this house. And God is talking about the prodigal son as opposed to the faithful son. A prodigal son sees his relationship with his father as a seasonal contract. That's a prodigal son. For him, the relationship is a seasonal contract. You notice with this guy... He related with his father like he was an unpleasant lecturer. Somebody he couldn't wait to get away from. What caused him to be like that? Maybe it was an offense. Maybe there's something the father did once that just really annoyed him or somebody else in the family. And all he wanted to do was go away. Maybe he felt better than his family. He felt these people are struggling. Uh, me, I'm better. Me, I'm not that kind of material. I think you guys are the ones who are slowing me down. I think if I was in another family, I'd be flying. Maybe that's what he felt. Maybe he resented being treated as a lastborn. Somehow they always talked about, I'm always called brother, so-and-so's brother. 
They've even forgotten my name. Even my dad calls me my brother's name. I want to get out of the shadow of others. And so he began to plot his move. He began to wait for the time he could take what he came for and leave. You know, prodigal sons will often refer to their spiritual leader as their boss. And usually not as a term of respect, but as a term of distance. This is my boss. Sometimes even when they say, this is my pastor, they don't really mean that. They just mean in a way of putting you in a space. Uh, there's a distance that they want to show. And what they're really saying is, I'm only here for a while. I'm only here for this season. Prodigals are only here for a season. If you have prodigals in your discipleship group, they're there for what they're getting that time. They're only there for a season. And when they know when something better comes, when another opportunity comes, an exciting church opens up in town. Hillsong Ministry finally opens. Elevation Church, Steve Fertig comes to Nairobi. Transformation, ay, 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 ay. Yeah. Michael Todd's church in Nairobi. I tell you, that is the last time you'll ever see them. In fact, I'd feel very sorry for Michael, Pastor Michael Todd if he came to Nairobi to open a church. Because his church would be full of prodigals. How many people know that? It would be people from other ministries. Papa, Pastor uh, Joseph Selman. Joshua Selman. If he came to this city and he opened a church, it would be full of prodigals. People who are not, they're just there because, my gosh, finally. They've been waiting for their season. And you know what they'll tell their pastor if they ever mention? mention they'll say, Pastor, I've been praying. I feel the season. I feel like the Lord is moving me. The Lord has nothing to do with it, by the way. They were just prodigals. They were just waiting for a better opportunity. And you know, John chapter 3, chapter 8, verse 35 says, Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs forever. A son belongs forever. A restless spirit is a prodigal spirit. Number two, a prodigal sees the father as someone whose time has passed. They look at their father and they say, this one, they don't understand. They're old-fashioned. They were there once. By the way, you know, many young people think their parents just are clueless. Many young people, they think their parents are the daftest people alive. Young people are so funny. They actually can assume that their parents know nothing. And sometimes it's not that the person is foolish. It's just that they're keeping quiet. It's because they don't even know which words to use. But it's like you can treat your parents like they were never young. And <laughs> it, it's so funny. I used to laugh at my kids. Sometimes they tell a lie and you look at them like, now, should I even say that I understand you're lying to me? Like, I look so stupid that you've lied to me like that. Like, I don't even know whether I should tell you or I just leave you in your ignorance. Because even me, I sneaked out of the house. Even me, I came up with stories. It's just that I know you look at me and you think, this one knows nothing. They've never been tempted. They've never had issues. Prodigals think their parents have never had issues like them. They can't understand them. But also, they think they're much wiser. You know, they say when your children are about from 16 to about 23, they really think they know a lot more than you. Then about 25, wisdom starts to check back in. At 25 is when they start going back to their parents and say, hey, by the way, you know something, Dad. <laughs> Eish. It's like you've, life has come on at you until you're like, hey, this one, they knew. By the way, they used to tell me this. I never used to believe them. But now I've, I've gone out, I've experienced, and I've realized they actually knew something. And you notice parents with about 25, 26, 27, the kids even like being around their parents. Something shifts usually, usually, if there was a good relationship before. And you know what happens is many prodigals, they forget that a time will come when even they will seem outdated to their own children. You know? A prodigal lacks wisdom and has ignorance because they don't understand that fathers become more powerful in their blessings as they age. They may not be able to run as fast as you, but God has a way that he blesses fathers with wisdom and with blessing as they age. And many of the blessings in the Bible were given by the oldest people, <laughs> people who seemed like they could do nothing. Joseph, he's leaning on a staff. A, a Jacob, he's leaning on a staff. He's probably stammering as he's blessing his sons. But you read those blessings and you find every one of them came to pass as he said it. 
Yeah, God honored. When Abraham blessed Isaac, those blessings came to pass as they were blessed. It's like God honors those blessings. Turn to your neighbor, tell them you need your father. Yeah, you do, you do. Don't be prodigal. Number three, a prodigal sees his relationship with his father in view of what he can get from it. What can I get? That's what a, what's in it for me? That's a question that prodigals ask. This boy was only here for what he could get. Give me my share of your estate. You know, in that culture, that was as good as saying, you might as well die. The people who are listening to Jesus would have been horrified that a person could say this to his father. He wanted his portion to do with as he wanted. You know, some young people, they see their relationship with their parents in terms of what they can get. The money that I can get. The airtime that I need. The transport money that I need. And there are even young people in this country who want their parents to die early so they get inheritance. You, you guys have never heard of such stories? Where I come from, there are young people who have prayed for their parents to die. And some of them have even answered the prayer. <laughs> oh my goodness. In ministry, a prodigal is only there for what they are getting. The only reason they're in your DG is the good feeling they're getting out of it. The only reason they come to your church is because of the sermons that they get. And they like those sermons, those particular things. It's something they're benefiting from. They come because they like to be prayed for. But they don't want to do anything that is inconvenient. A prodigal will resist the hardest way to do anything that is not on their terms. You're going to struggle when you're trying to get the DG prodigal members to show up for family night. They're going to, you're going to struggle with them. If you're a DG leader, you already know. I can see some DG leaders already. It's like you've got a tear. Like this pastor feels me. Because you've been trying to fight those prodigals. And they're giving you a hard time. It's hard to get them to show up for 4.30 prayer. It's hard to get them to stand on their videos. It's just hard. I don't know if you know anyone like that. Tell your neighbor, I'm sure it's not you. Yeah, you don't look like that. You don't look that material. Yeah. <laughs> Number four. A prodigal son thinks he has received all he can receive from his father. He believes he has received. There's nothing left. This, this person doesn't have anything that I need. And this young man was like, I've been here long enough. There's nothing that you can give me. There's nothing more for me to receive. I've outgrown this home. And they look longingly at other houses which look better than theirs. And they wish they could receive from those houses instead. In ministry, prodigals feel like they've received everything that that ministry has to offer them. They've listened to their spiritual father's sermons until they can already even, when he's talking, they even know where that story is going. They can tell which jokes he's about to crack before he cracks them. Anybody who's like that, you know all Pastor M's jokes. You can even finish his sentences for him. They never really listen to the messages. I mean, the message is preached once and they figure, you know what, I don't even need to take notes. I think I got it. I don't, there's, I don't have much that I can receive from here. You know, it's very interesting. If a, a famous prophet from another town visited, they'd be sitting on the front row with their notebook open, taking notes. But they never would take notes from their spiritual father. I remember one young guy who came and said, he greeted me, and he, he obviously was smitten. I mean, he was so happy to meet me. And he said, Pastor M, I promise you, I've listened to all of Bishop T.D. Jake's sermons, and I've listened to all your sermons. Like, I know them. And he was so excited. And I remember asking, which church do you go to? It wasn't Mavuno. I won't mention his church. I said, have you listened to your pastor's sermons? Needless to say, the conversation ended. He, I think I stopped being his friend at that point. <laughs> yeah, because it's like, so I'm not your pastor. Why have you listened to all my sermons and you've never listened to your pastor's sermons? But that's what prodigals do. They think that it's better out there. And so they are following other men of God, other women of God, because they believe that everything out there is better. And they're tired of the message in their house. That's a prodigal spirit. Tell your neighbor, that's not your portion. That's not your portion. That's not your portion. By the way, let me just say this. That, that, that young man, I really believe, unless he changed, he'll never get an inheritance. Because he's not a Mavuna. He's listened to all the Mavuna sermons, but he's not a member of the family. So he might say, yes, he's an acceleration. Praise God for him. But what is this pastor saying that is the inheritance of the house? 
He's missing out because of a prodigal spirit. Number five, a prodigal has no regard for the rest of the family. A prodigal has no regard for the rest of the family. You see, but this young man, by demanding his portion and insisting on taking it, he was putting the family at risk. Because you see, he was taking away capital that they had been accumulating for generations. He was taking away the family business. He was actually dividing it as opposed to building it. He was taking away all the investment that had been put into him because they had been grooming him. In those days, you groomed your son. So he was being groomed. He was putting the family's reputation at risk and shaming his father. And he didn't care. He just walked away and he left everybody to deal with the issues. You see, a prodigal only thinks of themselves. They think of their calling. You know me, I'm called. Me, I'm blessed for this. They don't realize that God calls us in the context of a family. This is a very powerful thing to understand. God calls us in the context of a family. You read the scripture and you'll find. God calls you in the context of family. He doesn't call you as an individual. But a, a prodigal will only think about their calling, their gifting. And many times they'll think, but you guys don't understand how gifted I am. You're slowing me down. And they'll think about themselves. And so as soon as an opportunity comes up, they will be off. And they won't care that they were the ones who were in charge of the worship team. Uh-uh. You people can figure yourselves out. The opportunity has come for me. They won't care that they were leading that, that, that group. They're the ones that you are depending on. By the way, I can see pastors, some of them are, are wiping their tears right now. Because they're getting what I'm talking about. The people just, somebody just walks out. They don't care. You guys sort yourselves out. I'm gone. And there they are. And they are gone. And you don't even know where they went. They just disappeared. <laughs> you know, I always, and I meet them, by the way. I meet them and it's like, oh, Pastor M, it's so good to see you. I'm so happy to see you. By the way, I haven't seen you for 10 years. Huh? You used to be a pillar in Mavuno Church and you disappeared. And it's like, oh, I thank God for you. You are the one who raised me. I came to Christ because of you. Inside, I'm thinking, I should be rejoicing right now. But this guy is such a prodigal. Like where you are, does your pastor even know where you are? Because you obviously left me without even saying. Prodigal spirit. It's a prodigal spirit. You know, it's interesting because many times when they're leaving, they use the God card. It's so hard for your pastor to fight with a God card. God has said, I leave. <laughs> Clearly, he doesn't see that he should talk to me also. So you just leave then. You know, it's like it's my season to leave. I'm like, okay, fine, just leave. Because that's a prodigal spirit. They don't think that God has any business talking to you because it's them. It's their calling. After all, what does that have to do with you? That's a prodigal spirit. Number six. Are you wondering why this pastor is preaching this? <laughs> oh, I'm still muted. <laughs> I, I really sense that God wants me to say these words because there's somebody here today who needs to repent of a prodigal spirit. A prodigal has no ownership of the family business. They have no ownership. The prodigal son felt entitled to, the entitled to the benefits, but not to the responsibility. They wanted the inheritance, but not the work that goes with getting that inheritance. They wanted the salary, but they didn't care what was left with the business. You know, in ministry, a prodigal son likes the benefits of being part of a ministry. They like it when things are going well, when things are exciting. But the moment the going gets tough... The tough gets going. Things are not working as well. This ministry is not looking as exciting. It's not as, it doesn't feel as, I don't get that feeling I used to get when I was younger. Somehow things are not happening. I remember somebody told me not too long ago, they said, remember when Mavuno was Mavuno? <laughs> Prodigal spirit, Shindwe. Like, seriously? And he told me that. He was like, remember the days when Mavuno was Mavuno? It's a prodigal, a prodigal son said that. Because he has no ownership. And by the way, he left when Mavuno stopped being Mavuno. You know? <laughs> I want to tell him, the things that we're experiencing now, you have no clue. And you have no part of it because you've left before you received an inheritance. That's the prodigal. They leave. They complain when things don't work. By the way, when prodigals complain, they complain so funnily. They say, this church, you guys don't even pick calls. Who are you guys? <laughs> it's like they don't have any ownership. It's about you guys. You should do better. They think of other people as you guys. And that's a prodigal. 
Again, let me tell you, some of you are not feeling this message yet. And if you're not feeling it, it's because you're not leading a DG yet. The minute you lead your discipleship group, start listening to this message again. Because at that point, you will be nodding your head and saying, come on, pastor, I am preach it. Somebody in my discipleship group needs to hear this message right now. Yeah, there's some messages that are for leaders. Huh? There's some things that leaders will understand. Number seven, a prodigal son is driven by his own agenda. He's driven by his own agenda. You know, this, this, was, a, this was a farm. This was an agricultural hold, a holding. Uh, was it harvest time? We don't know. Was it sowing time? Was it a time when they needed all hands on deck? We're not told. And the son doesn't care. Because his agenda is what's primary. It's what works for him. You see, in ministry, a prodigal son is also driven by his own agenda. He doesn't push the, the father's agenda because he's grown up. He knows what's best. Is the movement giving fast fruits? He says, well, I'm not so sure this is a good time for me. And if he's a, if he's a DG leader, he says, I'm not sure this is a time for, it's a good time to talk about this in my DG. You know, there are things happening. Maybe people have other issues. Let's discuss the issues that are relevant to my people. He has his own agenda. Have people been asked to organize a watch party for the gathering? Oh my goodness, does, does, do these pastors even know that my people are busy? Us, we are special. Our campus is special. Uh, my, my discipleship group, we are special. They have their own agenda. They don't do what other people are doing. Is there a discipleship le group leaders training? Ah, who needs another meeting? Does Pastor Kilons even know what a, a Friday, first Friday of the month even costs? Does he even know? Has he ever worked in a place like me? Does he understand the level of responsibility I have? <laughs> oh, I've, I've become unmuted. <laughs> Discipleship groups are supposed to meet on Wednesday night. Who said Wednesday night? Where in the Bible does it say they met on Wednesday night? And why should they meet every week? Our group, we like meeting once a month. And why is family night at 5.30 anyway? Who meets at 5.30 in this country? And why must we pray at the same time anyway? Can't God hear me alone? All these years, hasn't he been answering prayers? Even Jesus prayed alone. <laughs> oh my goodness. Tell your neighbor that's not you he's talking about. It can't be. No, it can't be you. That's not you. It's not possible. Tell your neighbor it's not possible. Ah, it's not possible he's talking about you. It's not, it's not you. It's somebody else. It's somebody else. My goodness, that is a prodigal spirit. That is a prodigal spirit. Number eight, a prodigal son is difficult to lead. Difficult to lead. Prodigal sons are difficult. You know, it's interesting because you notice this father doesn't try and beg. I beg. By the time your son tells you he's leaving with his inheritance, at least you should be able to say, by the way, son, I don't think that's a good idea. Let's talk. Ah, this one, the father is like, just go. <laughs> In fact, the father is like, I, I was wondering when he would go. It's like he has harassed his father so badly until his father just says, you want money here? Go. Because it's difficult. It's been difficult to lead all this time. There are some times that the followers that you're leading are so hard to, to lead that they wear you down. I've been in that situation. There's some, there's some people you get tired and worried just thinking about them. I told you I was like that, by the way, with Pastor Oscar. I, now I look back and I realize how prodigal I was. And sometimes God blesses you for your rebellion by giving you rebellious children. <laughs> oh my gosh, how many times have I had a chance to repent and say, oh God, forgive me. I hope I'm not being punished for my rebellion. There are some people who are just hard to lead. You enter the meeting and you're the leader, but you're already crafting the agenda with their objections in mind. It's like you're leading the meeting for them. Have you guys ever been there? Some of you even in the office, you've experienced that. It's like already the meeting is going on and you're already watching them to see how they're responding because you know the power they have. And already you can see them sitting like this. And they're looking at you like, yeah, tell me, what are you going to impress me with today? And the time starts running and you can see them looking at their watch. Like, I, are we done yet? And your heartbeat is already going up. If you say the meeting is two to four at... 3.54, you start seeing that the notebook is closed. And they even pull their chair away from the table like, okay, the meeting must be coming to an end surely because we are told four. Have you ever, by the way, some of you have never led anyone. That's why you're not even looking impressed by what I'm saying. 
There's some of you who are feeling pain when I'm talking right now because you know people like that. And they're so hard to lead. They're so stressful. I once had a person, not even once, but I remember one particular person who was very much like that. I remember when this person left my team, it was like a holiday. I was enjoying leading. I was like, all this time I've been stressed and I didn't even know. I didn't even know because it was so hard to lead. And the person, by the way, people like those, they don't, even, they don't actually come to your face and rebel. It's all body language. It's very subtle. It's very much those things of you can tell. Even when you're talking, you can see the way they roll their eyes. You're trying to convince them. You can see everybody else might be on board. But you, and you know what happens? Because they have power in the meeting, even the other people start watching them. And then your team starts being divided right in front of your very eyes. In fact, may, yeah, people are thinking now, this person isn't impressed, so maybe Pastor M isn't impressive after all. Maybe I wanted to say amen, but I looked at that person and I said, oh, maybe it's not amen time yet. <laughs> Let's wait. <laughs> Get the behind. <laughs> oh, gosh. Am I talking to somebody in the house? Let me tell prodigal spirit is not our portion in this church. In Jesus' name, I declare over your ministry, you will not have prodigals in your ministry. In Jesus' name, that is not your portion. God does not intend you to be frustrated as you serve him. And that's what a prodigal spirit does. Prodigals don't understand that difficult followers make terrible leaders. Yeah. If you're hard to lead, wait until the day you lead people. You will be shocked how bad a leader you will realize you are. The best leaders are the best followers. Number nine, the last one. A prodigal son does not value a father's blessing does not value blessing. You know, there are very many intangible benefits that come when you have a father in your life. This son thought that the father's usefulness was reduced to a paycheck, was reduced to a, a, an, an amount of money. That's what he had reduced his father to, to a share of an inheritance. He assumed that's a usefulness a father had in his life. But do you understand his life did not change for better because of that check? In fact, his life became a lot worse. For a Jew, to be able to be near a pig was already horrible. The Bible tells you he was eating the pig's food. That is the lowest you could ever go. And that's what happens. He rejects the father. He thinks the inheritance is what he has. He gets the inheritance and he lacks the blessing. He lacks the blessing. He doesn't understand the value of the blessing. He left behind spiritual cover. He left behind protection. He left behind stability. He left behind guidance. He left behind vision. He left behind blessing. He left behind wisdom. Intangible blessings. Have you ever realized that the difference between Esau and Jacob was nothing except a father's words? Have you ever noticed that? Two brothers. In fact, Esau is stronger. He's more muscular. He's more trained on the outside. He's more of a warrior. His brother is a kitchen boy. Shy, mommy's boy, not one who looks like he'll go far in life. His father speaks words, and those words make all the difference. And from then on, the family line takes the younger boy's line. This is what happens with the power of blessing. This son did not understand that God blesses fathers for us. God gives fathers blessings on our behalf. And unfortunately, he was going to learn this the hard way. Ephesians 6, 1 to 3 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for it is right. Honor your father and mother, the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well for you and that you may enjoy long life on earth. I want to just give you some, some quick blessings that will come when you choose to follow. Some very quick blessings. And I'm speaking to anybody who has recognized some prodigalness, a prodig prodigality, prodigal tendencies in your life. And I want to give you some blessings that will come to you after today when you choose to follow. Children, obey your parents in the Lord for it is right. Let's read verse 2. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. Verse 3. So that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on earth. The blessings of following. Number one, it will go well with you. It will go well with you. When you follow, 
The greatest blessing of a son is hidden in their father. This is something I've come to understand. You look at large families, you discover a very interesting secret. The sons and daughters who do really well are the ones who are close to their parents. You're just going to find a very interesting thing, that the ones who are blessed, the ones who look after their parents are the ones who seem to thrive. They turn out differently from the rebellious ones who resist advice. And it's true in the spiritual realm. Have you ever wondered why Jesus had some disciples who had all access pass? There's some disciples who wherever Jesus went, they went. The rest, I don't know where they had been sent. <laughs> but there's so many times when Jesus is alone with Peter, James, John. The three disciples. These disciples, one, Jesus was not, his, he was not one who was playing favorites. He's not one who was unfair. He didn't like, he didn't choose people and reject others. That's not what was going on here. It just seems that there were some disciples who were particularly interested in spending time with Jesus. And the more they spent time with Jesus, the more they looked for Jesus, the more they found him. The more they were in his life. And you know what happened at this, with these guys? They, they end up being the ones who see things that nobody else sees. When everybody else is not there, Jesus reveals himself. He transfigures. And they realize, oh my goodness, we thought he was just one of us. This is actually a divine being. And they see him talking with Moses and Elijah. How many know that Jesus, that God is not bound by time? That he's a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That doesn't mean he was the God of Abraham. Right now, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's not tight. He's talking to them right now. Why? Because for him, he's not bound by time. And Jesus reveals to them something that nobody else knows about him. And then he says, don't tell anyone. They're the ones who happened to be there. When he goes in to see Jairus and he heals the daughter, they're the only ones who see Jesus bringing this one back to life. Like, how do you bring someone back to life, someone who's dead? They're the only ones who get the mystery of seeing it because they have access to the deepest secrets. They're the ones who stay closest. They're the ones who tarry the most. When everybody else has gone, they're the ones who hang out. They don't want to leave the Father because they don't want to miss the blessing. You know, when you, when you follow your leaders hard, it will go well with you. You know, I've loved to see some of your campuses, some of you guys learning how to tarry. Uh, we, went, we went to one of our pastor friends, uh, Pastor Jimmy, of uh, Harvest Family Church in Rongai. And I remember I took my exec pastors. We went, and some of you also came who are not pastors. I think we should all go one day and visit those guys. And you know, I preached an evening service. And that church is an army, by the way. If you're talking about armies... That's a church that tells me we have a long way to go. I mean, they're a serious army. I remember Pastor Jimmy said, how many people are going to plant churches? The whole church. The whole church. They are, they are housewives. They are marketers. They are accountants. They are everybody. They are, they are an army. And you know, it's easy to put up your hand, but what happened next is what shocked us. Because it ended, the service ended at about nine. And it was a Sunday night. And so we went to uh, have tea, and uh, they had a tea for us with a pastor and their team. So they were hosting us. And we finished, we, we took about an hour. I mean, we had a leisurely conversation, and finally it was time to go home. And we came out. I, my pastors are nodding because they remember that shock. What a shock. <laughs> we came out of the room, and half the church was outside. This is 10 o'clock at night. We're like, what are they doing, Pasi? Tomorrow is work. And Pastor Jimmy said, they're waiting for a blessing. They know you're here and they're not leaving before you go home. And so they came and he said, I know you want a blessing. And so he said, Pastor M, here your people, bless them. So I spoke blessing over them. By the way, I blessed them seriously. Power. Like, people cannot wait for me an hour and then I just tell them, God bless you. Even my people are wondering, how come we're never blessed like that? <laughs> Like I released some serious blessing on that church. And then when I was done, they said, thank you so much, Pastor M. Now, our Father, please also bless us. And he also spoke blessing over them. And we walked out of that church, we drove out of that church at 10, 15, 10, 20, and we left them there. They waited for their pastor to leave and they left together. You know, we looked back and they said, hey, we need to get saved again. We don't clearly understand this following thing. There's a blessing of tarrying. It says, it will go well with you. Tell your neighbor, it will go well with you. 
Number two, you will live long. Yeah, you live long. In natural families, one of the biggest ways, one of the best ways to shorten your life is to dishonor your parents. If you want to have a short life, dishonor your parents. You know, in the Old Testament, the people who lived the longest, some of the people who lived the longest were people like Moses. Moses who lived till he was 120. It was interesting because in Deuteronomy 34 verse 7, it tells us Moses was 120 years old when he died. Yet his eyes were not weak and his strength was not gone. 120 years. Strength. Good eyes. It tells us about King David in 1 Chronicles 29 verse 28. He says he died at a good old age, having enjoyed long life, wealth, and honor. And his son Solomon succeeded him as king. Wow. Not just long life. You know you can live a long life that has serious issues. This man lived a long life with wealth and prosperity and honor. But you know, it's interesting. Both of these guys were amazingly honoring leaders. Amazing. I mean, David was one of the most honoring people in the whole Bible. Even when his boss was evil, David said, don't touch the Lord's anointed. His boss tried to kill him. That's how evil the boss was. Most of us would have been forming cliques, taking down the boss, showing, let, let me show him who's anointed here. David's like, no, no, don't touch him. That's God's, that's God's man. God has put him in charge. When God is tired, God will take him out. And David lives long. I believe this principle applies in the spiritual realm. When you honor your spiritual parents, you will have a long ministry. I say when you honor your spiritual parents, you will have a long ministry. You will have a long and successful ministry. You will bless people for many years. Ah, you know, Pastor Caro and I were clearing our, out some cupboards another day. And we saw a book. Remember, sweetie? It was a book when we were, when we were in our late 20s. What, what did I say? But she's my sweetie. Yeah. She's the sweetest thing in my life. In our late 20s, okay, now you're distracting my story. Can I finish, can I finish the story? So... In our late 20s, we saw a book that we had forgotten. It was a very thick book. It's a picture book. And that book was given to us in, a, we must have been about 28, 29 when we got that gift. It was given to us by a ministry that we were leading in the States that was a college ministry full of young, about 200 young American children. And I tell you, this is what it brought tears to my eyes because my sweetheart, she looked at it. And she said, oh my God, this is the same thing that people say about you today. This is exactly the same. People say you've changed our lives. We thank God because of your sacrifice. You have been our pastors and we love you. And on and on and on. We were only 28. We had no clue we'd still be doing this at 53. And we'd still be being a blessing to other people. God, our ministry has not even started. At a hundred, we will still be blessing people. As long as the Lord allows us on this earth, we'll have a long and prosperous ministry. Yes, we will. Me and my sweetie. Yeah. 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 How about you and yours? <laughs> Who are you going to bless and for how long? God's intention is that you will live long in the life he's given you. That you will bless people long after. Your blessing will continue long after you're gone. And the Bible says, bless, honor your father and mother so that you will live long. When you follow your leaders hard, you will live long. Tell your neighbor, you will live long. And by the way, say it like a blessing. Don't say it like you're just saying words. Tell them you will live long. Yeah. Long life. With long life, he will satisfy you and show you his salvation. That's what the scripture says. Number three, my last point. You will receive an inheritance you'll receive an inheritance. He says, so that you may live long in the land the Lord is giving you. This is what the scripture says in Exodus chapter 20 verse 12, where Paul was quoting. It says, honor your parents so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. God gives you inheritance through parents. He blesses you through parents. We've said this before, David honored Saul, King Saul, and he received the inheritance of kingship. 
even though there were no kings in his family. Elisha honored Elijah and he received the, the, the mantle of a prophet, even though there were no prophets in his family. When you honor your father and mother, you will live a long life in the land the Lord is giving you. God has appointed your parents, your spiritual parents, as a source of inheritance. And let me just say this, a person with an inheritance, how many of you know this? Somebody with an inheritance is very different from somebody without. Yeah. I know friends, by the way, who weren't doing very well, necessarily. At least not where they thought they should be. And then they got an inheritance. And it just changed their lives. Completely changed. When you have an inheritance, you're very different from someone who doesn't have an inheritance. You know, when I was growing up, I never wondered where my school fees would come from. I never once lost sleep thinking, will my fees be paid this term? I never once lost sleep thinking, will we eat tomorrow? I realize I'm privileged because some of you did not have that privilege. You lost sleep thinking, will I have school fees? And you see, that's the thing. I didn't earn it. I didn't ask to be born into it. I inherited it. That's the power of inheritance. You, you just receive it. It's how you're brought up. And you know what? It's not just things. One of the things about my family members is, and you see it in my, my wife farms this all the time, we all knew we would succeed. We just knew we'd succeed. Our parents weren't rich, but we knew. We had a belief that we would succeed, that we would travel and see the world, all my siblings. We knew that would happen for us. We knew that we, we, we didn't have problems with self-esteem. <laughs> By the way, I... I I don't even know problems of self-esteem. Like, oh, who is me? Will they like me? Ah, who cares if you like me or not? I'm your pastor. <laughs> it's not something that bothers me. By the way, I don't, I don't spend time wondering whether you like me. In fact, I assume it. But you know, it's not something I gave myself. There are some of you who are so terrified of what people think, and it's because nobody called that out of you. But this was my inheritance. That's the power of what my parents left me. I didn't have to work for it. And some of you, by the way, there are things that you will leave to your children that you are not left to by your parents. Because you'll be the first ones to break the chain of no inheritance and pass on inheritance. You'll be the first ones to leave that inheritance. Your children will not struggle the way you struggled. They'll be different from you. They'll be of a different material because of who you are. But you know what? This is what inheritance gives. I always think the best of people, by the way. My wife will tell you. I've been betrayed by so many people. But she'll come and tell me, what do you think about this person? I'll be like, you know what, I understand. I understand. Probably they have insecurities. I never take it like, oh ye, what did I do? For me, I'll be like, they probably have serious issues. I don't know. I release them. And I forget. She'll tell you. By the way, and don't try this, but if you offend me today, by next week, I'll probably be wondering. When you come to say, Pasi, I'm so sorry, I'll be like, okay. Like, I have no memory. Like, I forget when people offend me. Very easily. But it's not something I gave myself. It's where I came from. That's the family I was brought up in. That's the power of an inheritance. I believe that God has an inheritance for us in this house. I believe that God wants to release an inheritance on every single one of us. I believe that the blessings of this house are not for a few. They are for every child in this house. And I believe that as the Father deals with this prodigal spirit, some of us have prodigal spirit, as the Father deals with that prodigal spirit today, ah, that the Lord is about to pour out His anointing in ways He hasn't in the past. I'm going to invite the executive team, executive pastors, if they'd come. Just come up, the executive pastor couples, if they'd come. Come up on stage, come up on stage. These are sons and daughters of our house. Come on, let's appreciate Pastor Kara. She comes up. Amen. I need, I need someone to help me with the glasses over there. Pastor Elaine, if you could help me.
Can we just appreciate these amazing pastors? <laughs> Amen. So let me say this, an inheritance is not something you struggle for, it is yours. Say it's mine. Yeah. When you're an orphan, you have to make your own way, you have to fight for what's yours, you have to prove yourself. You have to provide for yourself not just food and a roof over your head, but values, identity, direction, vision, your sense of belonging. It's not to say you'll never make it, but it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Some of you have made it despite incredible obstacles and we bless God for you. Can you imagine if you had had an inheritance? Some of you, you'd be 10 times farther. You've come so far. But the power of inheritance is that it propels you. It gives you a place to step on. It multiplies times 10 the effect of what you've already given. You go so much farther. And it's the same way in ministry. That when you're in ministry, blessing and inheritance, you don't work for it. It flows through your parents. There's something that is interesting here. Are you seeing a problem? Are you seeing a problem? Yeah. What's the problem? I can't pour. What do they have to do if they want to receive the inheritance? Yeah. Yeah. God has a blessing, an inheritance, an anointing for you. This anointing was prepared for you before you were born. You're not in the ministry that you're in because you chose yourself. It is God who put you in this ministry. It is God who appointed you for this time. There are others who could have been here. Have you ever wondered about the disciples, how those 12 were picked and not others? But those are the ones that God picked. And there's a reason why you're here in this house. You don't work for inheritance. You don't strain for it. You don't strive for it. It is given to you. <laughs> 